Hello everyone, my name is Nsala and if you are a new subscriber or a returning subscriber, welcome back to my channel or if you're just a viewer, also welcome back to my channel, really appreciate it. And today we'll be focusing on the murder of Cheryl Avihe Uyaha and this case was suggested to me by one of my subscribers in the comments and I really appreciate that and I decided to then check into the case and finally talk about it today. So Cheryl Avihe Uyaha was a nine-year-old girl. She was born on the 28th of January in 2009. She attended Gamam's primary school and was doing her grade three. And her mother described her as a very confident, smart, extremely opinionated and very strong-willed girl. And her teacher also described her as a very smart girl. She was always really focused was always participating in class during exercises and activities and whenever the teacher would ask any question in class she was always one of the first to try to answer or to just you know she was just always a focused girl in class and Cheryl was the last born of her mother she was the daughter of Pekakawa Sylvia Kaimu and also the daughter of Isaac Uyaha and her father Isaac is based in the UK so they had plans or they had hoped that after two years and that would have been after Cheryl's 11th birthday she would have moved to the UK to live with her father who was based there and was married is married to a British woman and they share a child together so she would have moved there to live with her father and her family there however this never happened because Exactly seven months after Cheryl turned nine years old, she was brutally murdered. And so the case begins on the 26th of August in 2018. It was a Sunday and usually Sylvia, Cheryl's mother, said that on Sundays they would sleep in. But on this day, Cheryl decided to go very early to her friend's house just to play around and before she left, her mother told her to have breakfast, but she was more interested in playing. So she left the house and she went to go play with a couple of her friends. But after an hour or so, her mother Sylvia then decided to go call her back home to have her breakfast, take a bath, change her clothes because she was she literally went to play in her pajamas. So just to come back and change her clothes. And while Cheryl was doing that, Sylvia was busy cooking and doing the laundry at the same time. So Cheryl's mother, Sylvia, made a living by cooking and selling food. And that day she had a couple of deliveries she had to make to customers. So around 11 to 12 o'clock, Cheryl's mother, Sylvia, left the house to go and make these deliveries to her customers. And she left Cheryl in the care of her 19-year-old niece. She would have been responsible for the house. And she left, she set off to do her work. And at 3 p.m. she then returned back home. And when she came back home, she found the house completely empty. Nobody was there. She decided to just sit down, have a little bit of a rest. And after resting, when she felt that she was energetic enough again, she went now house to house, door to door, searching for her nine-year-old daughter. And as she was going house to house, going to all Cheryl's friends, everybody she usually played with, or any house that had any child her age, she unfortunately could not find her. And those people, the parents or the guardians, whoever were in those houses, didn't know or hadn't seen her at all. And that's when Sylvia became extremely worried and confused and just panicking at that point because she knew her daughter was really well behaved she wouldn't stay out very late in other people's homes and she went back to her own home and there she waited and waited for Cheryl and that's when she panicked more and decided to just call relatives that in case maybe while she was gone from the house one of the relatives came to the house and probably found Cheryl and decided to take her with them but as she called people, nobody had seen Cheryl that day at all. Nobody knew about her whereabouts and nobody just knew anything. And one of the people that Cheryl's mother, Sylvia, called was her sister, Batseba Kaimu. And Batseba was, uh, or is rather, 
a principal at Gamam's primary school and that's where Cheryl attended and she said she also hadn't seen Cheryl or knew about her and she explained how that day after church she had plans of collecting food because she asked Cheryl's mother Sylvia if she could prepare for her a meal and then after church she would pass by the house and collect that food but at lunch time when church was then over she decided to make a phone call to the house just to find out if the food was ready and if she could just make one drive to their house and then she would then proceed to her own home but when she called the first time at around 1 p.m nobody answered and that's when she decided then for a second time to make a second call and that time cheryl answered and she then asked cheryl if the food was ready and where her mother was but then Cheryl responded that her mother had not prepared any food and that her mother had gone out so nobody was at home. So but Seba then decided that there was no point to her you know, going branching off to their house to collect the food because there was no food. She then decided after church to just proceed to her own home and that's all she knew about Cheryl and she told her sister that and she had no idea where Cheryl was because it was very common for Bateba to pass by the house and pick Cheryl up on her way home and she would then later just inform her sister that she picked up her niece. But that's what the sister believed happened but it hadn't happened that day. And then when they continued searching and searching for Cheryl, nothing was happening. And that evening, Sylvia then decided to go to the police station to file a missing persons report because it was just obvious that something was wrong. But when she got there, she was informed that it was too early for her to make a missing persons report and she would have to return after 24 hours if she still hadn't found her daughter. And of course she was panicking, she wasn't happy with this response because she wanted an urgent you know, response to her frustration or to her pain or to her you know, anger and she felt like they were not taking the situation seriously. But Nevertheless, she then decided to return back home and the entire night she was just so sad and just so worried about her daughter. And the next morning at 8 a.m., she couldn't even wait the entire 24 hours. She decided to return back to the police station and file the missing persons report. And this time they took it seriously. But now, one of the neighbors who lived in the neighborhood with them explain how that same day which was the 26th of august she had seen cheryl and cheryl passed by her house and was looking for her very close friend they had been friends since they were four years old but unfortunately she couldn't find her friend so cheryl returned back to her house and then around 1 p.m cheryl came back out and was looking for that exact same friend but she was then informed that her friend had gone to her aunt's place and wouldn't be around. And that's when Cheryl began playing briefly with that neighbor's child and they were playing outside. And when the neighbor, neighbor decided to just go in the house and I believe she just turned around for a couple of minutes when she came back out found that Cheryl was gone. So she just assumed and concluded that she had probably just gone back home. And now people were lost and didn't understand if she even made it back home, had she made it home or something happened on her way home or maybe while she was out there somebody called her or she went to another friend's house. They had no clue or any idea as to what had happened that day. And about less than 24 hours actually, her mother Sylvia was called in to go to the mortuary to identify a body. So on the 28th of August in 2018, which was a Tuesday, barely two days after the disappearance of Cheryl, the mutilated body of nine-year-old Cheryl Avihe Oyaha was discovered by a passerby. And this was in the morning at around 7.30 a.m. And the body was covered in the riverbed between Katutura and Komasdal near Shanghai Street, or others might know it as the riverbed which is near the Stanvas circle in Komasdal. And when the police were then alerted, we, who arrived at 8 a.m., 
when they did further inspection of the area and the body, the body appeared to have been boiled in hot water before it was dumped at the crime scene. And also the mutilation was done in such a way that one foot, one thigh, both arms, her neck, ribs and internal organs were missing. And after this discovery then, this gruesome discovery, the police opened a case of murder and obstructing the cause of justice. The police also offered a 30,000 Namibian dollar reward to anyone who would bring forth information that would help in the apprehension and the persecution of the perpetrator or perpetrators. And when this was fruitless, no information was coming forth, nobody was bringing up anything tangible, they then started to increase it to a hundred thousand Namibian dollars, hoping that this would, you know, give the incentive or really encourage people to bring forth information or any clue or tips that they have. And also when this didn't work, they added another ten thousand on top, making it a hundred and ten thousand Namibian dollars. So that is the current amount that's out there for anybody who has any information about the murder or the disappearance of Cheryl Avihe Uyaha. And this of course was a very traumatic experience for the family. Until now I cannot imagine that they, they can heal or will ever heal. It was really painful for a mother to bury her last born child and or any of her children at all just to bury her one of her babies must have been really hard and just so painful she had to go through the different stages of grief and it was so hard she began seeing a counselor to help her deal with this because like her aunt Batseba said when they were called to come identify Cheryl's body at the mortuary they didn't believe it and they said that you know what when we get there when we see with our own eyes that it is the body of Cheryl that's when we'll accept that she's dead but before then they were still in, in denial they didn't accept that Cheryl was gone until they saw her body lying there lifeless that's when they accepted that she indeed was gone and her family is very strong her aunt is very strong because to deal with this and her father Isaac flew in from the United Kingdom just to attend his daughter's burial and Cheryl was then buried on the 8th of September in 2018 at the Pioneers Park Cemetery and a lot of people attended this funeral including some really important officials, the First Lady, the Prime Minister, other members of cabinet and the opposition members, they just came to pay their condolences and to just show her family love and to show Cheryl love and respect. And this meant a lot to the family. But one of the things that the family was not happy about was when her mother went to make the police report or file in the missing persons report, they felt like the officer who was on duty didn't respond in a very, you know, like in the urgent way or didn't seem interested or you know just wasn't reacting in the way that they expected the police officer to react so they filed a complaint and I believe until now it's still under review they haven't come to any conclusion in that case but until now whoever did this to Cheryl is still out there the person has never been found they have no idea what the person even looks like if it's a man a woman if it's a group but one of the things people really feel sure about is that whoever did this must have either been someone that Cheryl really trusted, meaning someone that was already close to the family or someone she already knew because she left that neighbor's house well and nobody ever heard any shouting or screaming or any fighting to you know indicate that someone was in distress. Everything was calm so it either is somebody she knew or even if she didn't know the person, it's someone that made her feel safe or comfortable. Maybe like a woman who maybe lured her in. And they believe this because it just made no sense how if she was kidnapped or grabbed from the street that nobody would have heard any yelling or any screaming. So that's one of the things they believe that it must have been someone who made her feel comfortable or someone who was known to her or the family. They then believe that whoever had done this, might have been someone who was just organ harvesting because like I said her internal organs were missing and Cheryl was buried without her, some of her body parts like I said this was one foot, one thigh, 
This was her neck, her ribs and internal organs. They were never found and until now have never been found. So I understand what you might do with the internal organs, but what they might have done with her leg, her, her thigh, her arms, it makes no sense to me. That's why some people believe that this might have been ritual killings, just like that of Maseho Como, the case I did earlier on, I think it was my first case, that it was something similar to that, that they used her body parts for muti. And however, all this have of course never been confirmed because the police don't even know who did this. Nobody knows who did this to Cheryl. And just like other murders in Namibia, where it feels like these people commit these crimes and they know that they will get away with it because Namibia lacks the skills, the manpower, the knowledge, the money to carry out proper investigations, the equipment as well. It's kind of like people know or these criminals know that if you do it in Namibia, you will get away with it. And these families have to live with this, never receiving complete closure as to know who did this and know that whoever caused them this grief or this pain is paying for you know, their crime or for their sins and they're able to just roam around the streets like a normal person. Because we never know what if the person who did this to Cheryl is the same person who did this to Magdalena or you know all the other people who have been murdered. You never know because you're not finding out who did this. It's been a really you know heavy case on the public as well they could not believe it when this such a thing happened it was just so horrific really for the family and everyone that was involved so until now the information is still there the numbers are all out there in public as to who people can contact if they have any leads or any tips as to who they believe might have done this to Cheryl like I said there's a hundred and ten thousand and even dollars reward to anyone who can help them in this case and that is basically it for this case. We pray that Cheryl may rest in peace, but I'm sure she will not until whoever has done this is caught. And that's why everybody really needs to help the police because you already know that they are unable to do anything by themselves. So they really need the tips to be able to close such a heavy case. But yeah, that is it for this case. And I hope that the person is found or the group whoever did this but yeah until next time i want to thank you all for your time so goodbye and take care bye